week uh, four of Scandalous. We're closing this series. Here's what we've been doing. We've been talking about the women in the Bible who are scandalous, women who did not live uh, Christian lives. They're not women who we would think would be celebrated by Scripture, yet they are tied to the life of Jesus. In the book of Matthew, as it goes to the list of Jesus' family all the way back through history, we have four women who are actually mentioned in Scripture. Now, just culturally in the Bible days, women were not uh, they were not mentioned for anything. They were not celebrated. They were not uh, known. Women were in the background. They were pushed to the back. So these were pretty incredible women to be listed in Scripture. Now, when you think, just, hey, these ladies must have really done something incredible. You see their names. It's in Scripture. And then you start doing a little digging. You realize that these were prostitutes. These were women from lives of incest. I mean, all different backgrounds that these women have walked through. So what we've been discovering is, is that what God has done through those ladies, if God can take their lives and clean them up and use them for great things, God can do the same thing in our lives. And we've been using this verse of scripture. It's on your outline for your message today. It's in your worship guide if you haven't pulled that out. Grab that and take a look at this with me. Romans chapter 8 verse 35 says this, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Simply saying, what could take place in our life? What could ever happen so great, so bad, so difficult that God couldn't forgive us of? And what Scripture is saying is that there is nothing in your life that will ever separate us from God. So no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter where we sit today, what is happening in our life, there is hope for you and for me. And I don't know what that means to you, but that is encouraging for somebody like me. Okay, There is still hope today, no matter where we've been or what we're going through. So today, to close this series, we're going to talk about Bathsheba. How many of you have ever heard of Bathsheba? Now, I don't know what you have to be on to name your kid Bathsheba. I mean, I don't know... What does that even, I mean, look at little Bathsheba. That's just even difficult to say. It's just bad all the way around. But as we conclude this series today with Bathsheba, uh, you've heard the story many times in the context of David and Bathsheba. They're always connected together because their story goes hand in hand. But doing a little backstory just on Bathsheba, you learn that uh, she's a lot different from the other ladies that we've talked about. She's different in the fact that she comes from a very godly background. She's not the prostitute that we talked about in week two that just suddenly realized that God had a different plan for her life, that she had been living far from God. This lady grew up in a godly household. We know this because her father was one of David's most trusted leaders in the army. And he was a very godly man trusted by David. Also, her husband Uriah was also one of David's most trusted men. And he was a very godly man also. So everything we see about her is that she was raised in a godly environment, that she knew God, she knew right from home, right from wrong. One of the other things that the Bible notes about her is that she was very beautiful. The Bible noted her good looks. Now, fellas, most of you, if you would be honest, your spouse or the people that you're potentially looking for, that's one of the things that you notice first. All this personality stuff, you can throw that out the window. Let's just be honest. We're in church, so we can't lie in here anyway, right? You saw them from across the room, something caught your eye, there was just a little something going on, we'll leave it at that, okay? We'll stop right there. But Bathsheba, the Bible says, was very beautiful. And we know this because when we're introduced to Bathsheba, we're also introduced to a circumstance going on with King David. Now, King David is the little shepherd boy. Remember David and Goliath, the little boy who slew the giant? It's the same David. He's now king. Now, the Bible tells us, starts out in 2 Samuel, it says that at this time of season, normally the king would be away at war. Because apparently there were certain seasons that war took place and there were certain seasons where you would rest. This is a season where they were at war. All of David's army, all of his men are out battling. But David, for whatever reason, decides to stay back. Kings did not do that. Kings went to battle with the rest of the army. But the Bible says David stays home. And on this particular day, David had been taking a nap. You know, the life of a king, that's pretty difficult, isn't it? Everyone's out fighting. He's left at the palace. He's just had a nice nap. He wakes up, and the Bible says he goes to the top of the building. 
And he begins to walk on his rooftop, and from where he is on his rooftop, he spots not a personality, but a very unusually beautiful woman. That's what the Bible says. Now, this unusually beautiful woman was not playing Monopoly or Uno, you know. She was taking a bath. Now, David, instead of having better judgment, didn't go, oh, you know, I need to go back in the house. David pulled up a lawn chair, got out the binoculars. Creepy, okay? Let's be honest. And he took a moment just to, just to, you know, just to notice the beauty of God and his creation. You know what I'm saying? So as David camps on this roof, here's what David does. He calls to his servants. He says, hey, come here. I need you to see something. Uh, that lady right there, do you know who that is? And they say, well, yeah, that's, that's Bathsheba. And he says, what kind of name is that? But forget her name. Her beauty overtakes Bathsheba, okay? David says, bring her to me. So they go. They get Bathsheba. says, hey, listen. Now, you need to put some clothes on. The king has requested your presence. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if, if uh, you know, our president, you know, if President Obama called, wrote me a letter, said, hey, I want you to come hang out with me at the White House. I would say, what plane do you want me to get on? I mean, I'm going to the White House. I'm going to hang out with the president, okay? Now, I'm going to go hang out with somebody who is important. Now, Bathsheba got her clothes on. She got her hair just right. She was going to go and visit the king. The problem is when she reaches the king, David's got something in mind that maybe she didn't intend. Because notice the Bible has told us that David is a man after God's own heart. He's a godly man. He was chosen as king. He was anointed as a young man because his heart was in love with God. Now, I'm sure Bathsheba was in no way thinking that anything would be uh, wrong or out of place for her to go visit the king. But when she arrives, David has a totally different idea. The Bible says that David and Bathsheba slept together. And when she left and time passed, David didn't talk to her again. He didn't see her again until that one day he gets that dreaded phone call that says, uh, David, I've got some news that I need to tell you. I'm pregnant. And that's when you know it all goes downhill from there, right? I mean, you've seen the stories. You know, you've watched the movies. Some of you have lived through some of these circumstances. And she says, David, we've got a problem. I am pregnant. Now, David, the great king, says, don't worry. Go home. I've got a plan. He calls his, her, her husband, Uriah, says, I need you to come home. I want you to have a break. Man, you're such an incredible soldier. Come home. The Bible says that David actually gave a gift to Uriah. Like, what's he into? Is he into fishing, hunting? Let's get him a new gun. Send it to him. Gold plate that baby. Deliver it to his door. Here's what David was saying. He's been away at war. He's been away from his wife. Come on, somebody. I mean, you know what I'm saying? If we can just get him home, this baby situation will take care of itself. Because we can say, we time this situation, that is Uriah's baby. The problem is, David, because he's so often left field, has forgotten about what a godly man Bathsheba's husband is. So when he comes home, here's what he says. He says, I, it's, I can't go sleep with my wife. He said, all of my friends, all of the soldiers, they're at battle. They're at war. I can't come home and sit in luxury and spend time with my wife. So he refuses. The Bible says that Bathsheba's husband doesn't even go sleep in the house. He stays at the gates and will not even put himself in a circumstance or situation. So big idea nixed right there. David's plan backfired. It didn't work. So now what am I going to do? How do we cover up this sin David says drastic times calls for you know, drastic measures, right? So David says, here's what I want you to do. He calls the leader of his army. He said, you take Uriah, you put him on the front lines. He said, when you go to battle, I want him on the very front lines because David's goal, as bad as this is, was for his life to be taken. So that's exactly what happens. They put Uriah on the front line. As he goes to battle, his life is taken from him. David gets word that his life has been taken. Bathsheba gets word that her husband has died, a good, godly man. So here's what happens. David and Bathsheba become married. If we're married, then everyone, it will make sense. It'll all just, it'll all just work itself out. See, what's happening here is, is it's this snowball effect of there was just this one simple situation that turned into something that it shouldn't, and now someone's life has been taken. Now David has married this woman. Now, I'm telling you, she didn't love David. Put yourself realistically in her situation. 
She's feeling taken advantage of. She's feeling abused. She's heartbroken because the husband that she loved, his life has been taken. And all of these things are happening. All of these emotions, all of these feelings. And to top it off, she's pregnant with a baby. What's everybody going to say? What's going to happen? But David is just trying to cover and cover all this sin, cover this plan. The only problem is he couldn't cover it from God. The Bible says that judgment came on their family and they lost the baby. The baby died. The baby did not live. So we bring ourselves now to this situation where we've met David and Bathsheba in what can seem to be one of the most horrific circumstances you could ever imagine. King David, who loves God, who is a man after God's own heart, who's been chosen by God. Bathsheba, who comes from a godly family, who knows what it is to serve God, to be people of character and integrity. And because of life, circumstances, bad decisions, they stand in a place of life change. When you get to this place, what do you do with it? How do you get there? How does the story unfold? This morning, I want to walk back through, and I'm going to give you three things this morning from this story that I think God can give to us today as just a warning sign about the way we live our life, the decisions we make, and also the goodness of God and what He can do with our mess. Okay, Let's pray over the Word today. Father, we love You. We celebrate You today, Jesus, that we get to come and we get to listen to Your Word, God, and let it speak to us. Let it change our heart today, God. Let it guide our minds and our thoughts today, Father. God, let it change us. God, so open our ears to hear you. God, our minds to understand you and our hearts to retain the word. Speak to us today, God. We want to be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me give you three things. Here's what I call a reality check out of this story. Number one, here's a reality check. Temptation is real. The first thing I want us to grab hold of this morning, temptation is real. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much you love Jesus. I don't care how long you pray every day. I don't care if you can quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I don't care anything about how deep and great you are. Temptation is real. There's not a person in this building today that can overcome temptation on your own. You can't do it. Every individual has a weak spot. And the enemy knows exactly what it is. Temptation hits every one of us. 2 Samuel 11, 2 and 3. Here's the way it happened. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed, was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was. That was the moment of temptation for David. Notice that David was somewhere he shouldn't have been. He should have been at war. He should have been gone doing what his position, what his authority, what his role, what his place caused him to do or called for. But instead, he positioned him in a, himself in a possibility of temptation. Now, every person in here, you can stop and think right now, what is your weak spot? What is, your, what is your area if, of temptation, and what do you do about it? How do you overcome that temptation? I heard a story this week about a sailor who was going off uh, into the service, and he was going to be away for about two years. And a- after a period of time of, of being gone, his wife received a letter in the mail that said, that said Sweetheart, I-, I need some help. said, I'm really struggling out here. There's a lot of temptation. He said, you know, I've, I've been away for a while. He said, we are constantly surrounded by these beautiful island girls. And he said, I, I just need, I need a hobby. I need something to get my mind straight. So she writes him a letter and gives him a package in the mail. And he opens it up, reads the letter, and she says, here, I gave you this harmonica so that you can learn a new hobby. She said, whenever you're tempted, whenever you feel weak, she said, you need to learn to play this harmonica. Just spend time learning this new instrument. So after the tour is over and he returns home excited to see his wife, he says, honey, said, you know, I'm I'm so glad to see you. And he grabs her, gives her a big hug, and kind of gives her that little tug, and she stops. And he says, what's wrong? She says, I need to hear you play that harmonica. (laughs) Let me see how well you did at overcoming this temptation. 
How do you overcome temptation in your life? Now, there's a process. Now, this is not on your outline, but if you're a note taker, maybe you want to write down these little, these little, what I would say is a process of falling into temptation. Little warning signs for us. Here's what I'd say. Number one is there's an opportunity. Just as David stood on the roof, saw this woman, knowing he had all the power to have anyone go get her, and bring her to himself. He knew he had the authority to do that. He knew that when this woman came into his presence, that suddenly she's going to be starstruck. She's standing in the palace of the king. He wants to talk to me. Can I tell him no? What happens? What do I do? And suddenly she's in a place of pressure. He knew the authority he had. He spotted an opportunity. Whenever temptation comes your way, you know, you see it. It's standing out and yelling at you. Look at the opportunity you have to fulfill the desires of your sinful self. Number two, you look at it. Now, let's just be honest. You're at Walmart. I don't know if Walmart's the best illustration to give on this, but let's just say by miracle you're at Walmart, and down the grocery aisle is the most beautiful or good-looking thing you've ever seen besides your spouse. But you know it's running a close race, okay? Not my spouse. I said your spouse, okay? So this is the way it's going in your situation. So there you are, and here's what happens. You get the opportunity to go, God blessed you, and then just turn and go on about picking up, you know, your grocery items or whatever, picking up tires and and eggs at the same time in Walmart, okay, whatever. You got this opportunity to either look away and say, okay, I'm going to take care of my thoughts, I'm going to take care of my eyes, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, or you have an opportunity to park the buggy and just kind of prop up and just admire God's creation, okay? Let's be honest. Now, you have the opportunity to look away. But what happens is, is a look becomes a stare. And then a stare becomes an emotion or a feeling. And that feeling or that motion becomes an action. And then once the action has taken place, there's no going back to correct it. What's done is done. The damage has been done. David not only saw, he could have looked away. He could have said, you know, didn't expect that today. Let's, you know, unforeseen blessing, let's go. Okay, you know? That's what David would have said, let's correct this, Jesus, let's get our minds straight, okay? But he didn't. The look became a stare. Now here's what happens. Number three, you reason. You begin to reason. I really shouldn't be here. My wife would kill me. My husband would kill me. I really should just shut the computer down, but nobody will know. You begin to reason in your mind. You say, you know what, I deserve just a little... Just a little indulgence every now and again. I work hard. I do, you know, you can reason. My relationship's not what it should be. You know, nothing's happening at home. I mean, come on. You reason all of the, all the thoughts that are going through your mind. You try to piece those together to put the picture together that you want. You ever bought a puzzle and you're missing that one piece and you can't figure it out and you just try to squeeze it in there because you want to make it fit? You do that with your thoughts and your ideas. You're squeezing everything around, trying to make it fit to get the image that you want to get. The next one I would say is you take a step. You've reasoned it in your mind about all the reasons why you should, you shouldn't fall into that temptation, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be a sexual temptation. It could be any temptation in your life. But you take a step in that direction. And then once you've taken a step in that direction, the last thing is you have begun a cycle. You started a cycle. Because it's like a baby. You ever notice that a baby, when it cries, you feed it, and you think you're done with it, and then it cries again and expects to be fed in a few more hours? Isn't that weird? You think, didn't we just do that? You know. But as soon as that baby gets a taste of it, it just wants some more. You know. And then as soon as that baby understands that those little squashed-up peas in that baby jar is not the best, and there's some other stuff out there, some candy, hey, I don't want those vegetables. Can I have some cake? You know what I'm saying? Once you feed your flesh those desires that you want, it's hard to satisfy it with anything else. Now, you know if your kids are sitting there with cake or vegetables, as long as you're there, it's vegetables and then it's cake. If you leave the room, the vegetables are off the table and the cake is front and center, okay? When you feed your flesh, let's be honest, the temptations of life, the vegetables are off the table and the cake is front and center. Because you begin a cycle, and once you feed it, it only wants more. Now, how do you overcome it? Let me give you one word. Write this down. It's not on your outline. 
It's in a verse of scripture, but I want you to write it big. Run. R U N. Run. Pastor Brandon, what do you mean? I mean, if you're in Walmart, just leave the buggy and just run flailing, you know? <laughs> Scream your wife's name and run, okay? And make sure you flail as you go, okay? Listen to what the Bible says. Run from anything, anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Run from anything. Instead, pursue things that are pleasing to God. Because once you learn some vegetables that you do like, you'll just go back to those vegetables, okay? Once you feed yourself with godly things, your spirit becomes stronger than the flesh. And your spirit's desire is stronger than your sinful desire. But if you're building up that sinful desire, it becomes stronger than the spiritual. And every time the physical will overcome the spiritual if you're feeding the wrong thing. Run from the things in your life, church. Change your relationships. Change your habits. Change your internet viewing. Cancel the subscription packages. I mean, it's 2014. Just cancel cable. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Just put... I mean, no one has ever went... Let me just be plain. No one has ever went to a rated R movie and said, I cannot believe how awful it was. I mean, the language... You wouldn't believe how many times I said it. The people that were... I mean, no one ever goes there and expects a rated R movie to be something you'd carry the kids to. It's rated R. You know it before you walk into the movie, okay? Don't pretend to be blindsided by your temptations when you know it before you walk into it. Run from it, okay? Number two, write this one down. Here's a reality check. Consequence is real. Consequence is real. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I am pregnant. That's a bad day. For the king. Because the woman who's pregnant is not his wife. As a matter of fact, it's the daughter of one of his most trusted leaders. It's the wife of one of his most trusted soldiers. That's a really bad day. We walk through life sometimes, church. Let's be honest with ourselves. And we ask God, why a lot? God, why does this happen? God, why am I struggling? God, why, 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 why? But very rarely do we look back and go, well, I made this decision and I did this. I could have went right, but I chose to go left. I should have said no, but I said yes. We forget about all those things and we say, but God, why? There are consequences to all of our sins. Everything we do, we will face consequences in this world. I put three different little categories down. One was emotional consequences. These are just extra notes that I wrote for myself. It always hits us emotionally because... The shame, the guilt, the fear, the regret, all of these things that come along with it. Every time you fall into temptation, all of these things had to have been going through Bathsheba's mind, through David's mind. Surely Bathsheba was saying, I should have said no. Why did I go? Why did I put myself in this circumstance emotionally destroyed? Physically, she's pregnant. It's a physical consequence. Her husband is dead physical consequence. They lost the baby. A physical consequence. And spiritually. It's the worst of them all. The spiritual consequences. God was displeased with them. Isaiah 59 verse 1-2 says this. Look, listen. God's arm is not amputated. This is out of the message. I love it. He can still save. God's ears are not stopped up. He can still hear. There's nothing wrong with God. The wrong is in you. That's, that's tough. Your wrong-headed lives caused the split between you and God. Your sins got between you so that He doesn't hear. Here's what the Bible tells us. Sin separates us from God. God didn't move. I did. My sin causes distance between me and God. It's like me and my wife. Now, when we argue and fight, now I give her a hard time on Sundays, but I'm going to tell you, I got the best wife in the world. I love my wife, okay? But for some reason, our, I, she, okay, I, I'm not sure. Let me. 
when I communicate, she doesn't clearly understand what I'm saying. So somewhere there's this you know, loss of translation in this funnel somewhere. I don't know what happens. And it usually causes a little tension, a little strife, you know. And every now and again, that tension or strife would just escalate. You know what I'm saying? You guys don't know what I'm talking about, but it can tend to escalate, okay? Now, in our relationship, when things tend to escalate or, or get out of hand, it causes a little bit of a division between the two of us. So there's a separation that happens. Well, when there's separation that happens between us, we are a lot uh, worse. Some of you guys say, praise the Lord, she's mad. I've got a few hours to go fishing or do whatever I want to do. Now, for us, it just gets worse. It just really puts a lot of strain on the relationship. Now, what happens is it's not that I don't love her anymore or she stopped loving me. It just is that there are issues in the way that has caused us from communicating or wanting to communicate or being in the same room, okay? With God, when sin comes and separates us, God can't look on sin. God will never be right in the middle of sin to just roll around in it with you. God is saying, I am always here for you. But God won't walk down in the midst of your sin. Now, a sin is knowing to do right but choosing to do wrong. That's when we sin. You didn't say something that you didn't realize you said and and knowingly sin, you made a decision to do something against what God wants for you. And the last thing I'll give you is this. Redemption is real. Then David comforted Bathsheba. This is after the baby died, his wife. He slept with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and David named him Solomon. The Lord loved the child and sent word through Nathan the prophet that they should name him Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord as the Lord had commanded. And then Romans 5.18 says this, Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. Now here's what I love about this, is the fact that redemption has taken place in their life. Because redemption is real. See, this morning, anything that God would, would put on you, anything that God brings to your life, anything that God would allow to happen, see, when, when all this took, took place and Bathsheba realized that something was wrong, the, the baby, baby wasn't going to make it. When David realized that all of his actions to this point have just accumulated itself to really, really bad circumstances. You begin to think back through that process, what did I do? Will God ever love me again? Will the plan or purpose of God's life, will it, will it, ever, will it ever come back around? I mean, I'm sure as David sits there and says, God, I remember the days when I was just a boy. And I was taking care of those sheep and I spent those time praying to you, talking with you and, and asking for your favor and your blessing on my life. God, I can remember the days that I just wanted so bad you to use me to do something great. And then all of those times, all of those miracles, all of the things that God did, now he sits in a place and he says, God, everything's gone. I've lost it all. Bathsheba sits there and says, why did I ever say yes. Why did I ever make this decision? God, will you ever make anything out of this mess? But the Bible says once they got themselves together, David comforted his wife. God blessed them with another son that the Bible says the Lord loved the child. That's redemption. That's things that were broken. That's things that were hopeless. Things that seemed lost. Things that seemed that they would never be useful again. God looked at this couple and said, In the midst of everything, you guys committed adultery. Your spouse was killed. You've made a mockery, King David, of your leadership position. But because of your heart, because I love you, and because I'm a good God, and because you repent, 
and you come to me with a broken heart, I will redeem. Not only will I redeem, but I will bless. What you lost, I will give back. Your marriage, I'll give you back that marriage. I will bless your child. It's a child that I love. Now, here's some cool things that, as the story begins to unfold, the baby they have, Solomon. Solomon actually wrote a great portion of the Old Testament. And in the book of Solomon, that he wrote, it's one of the greatest love books, greatest love stories, the greatest wisdom on love. Guys, you should go home and you should read it. Ladies, you should go home and you should read it, okay? And forget Shades of Grey or whatever that nonsense is. Go home and, and read this book, okay? There's some good stuff in that book, all right? Now, here's what's interesting. God blessed them with another son who was loved by God. Solomon eventually became king, just like his father. Not only did he become king, but he was the wisest king and the wealthiest king. Now, this is cool. He wrote Proverbs 22 and 6. Many of you heard the verse that says, if you train a child in the way they should go, that when they're old, they will not depart from it. You've heard that in uh, you know, graduation. You know, even if you don't go to church or anything, you've seen it written on books and all these different things for graduation. Where Train a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. When he wrote that, how did he know to write something like that? He knew to write something like that because it was modeled in front of him. A couple who began in the worst of circumstances, modeled before their son as he grew up, that if you'll train me in the love of God just like my parents trained me, when they're old, the blessing of God will be on their life and they won't depart from it. Now notice what a powerful verse of Scripture, a powerful promise but notice the origin of where it come from. And Bathsheba is said to have written Proverbs, Proverbs 31 that talks about a virtuous wife. The qualities of a, of a woman that you would want to marry, fellas. And here's what's cool about it. It's said that she wrote that in honor of Solomon's wedding. That she wrote this out as a, as a message to him and, and his bride. That this is a great picture of a godly woman who will lead her household with her husband, who will raise her children, who will be a good wife to her husband. Now how awesome is that, that God redeemed all that seemed lost, all that seemed broken, and He put it back together to do incredible things with it. Bathsheba made some bad decisions. She went through a lot, a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of circumstances in life. But because of the goodness of God, and a repentant heart in herself, God redeemed every area of her life. The great news for us today is that no matter where you are, no matter what circumstance you're in, no matter what bad decision you made yesterday, God will redeem every area of your life. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to pray for you. I want you just to maybe bow your head, just close your eyes where you are. The worship band's going to come up, and they're just going to play something just real quietly, but I want to take just a moment with you this morning. And I just want to pray for you. And there's a couple of things this morning that I just want to, I want to ask you. One, the most important question anyone could ever ask, the most important decision you could ever make is if you're in this place and you've never given your heart 100% to Jesus. You've never said, God, I'm, I'm giving you my life. Jesus, I want to be sold out and devoted to you. Maybe you know who God is. Maybe you attend church. Maybe you've read the Bible. You've seen the stories. You've, you've experienced it, but you've never said, Jesus, I belong to you. This morning, if that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity, and I'm going to pray for you. And then the rest of us this morning, that maybe you're here and you just say, you know what? I have struggled with some situations, some circumstances. There's been some things in my life that I just need God just to help me with. And maybe this morning you've decided that you're just tired of fighting it on your own. You're tired of going through the pain, the emotion, the hurt, the shame of it, carrying that guilt on your own. And this morning, maybe you just want us to pray and say, God, I need you to take it from me. I need you to heal me this morning. Before I pray for you, what I want you to do is grab that Connect card that I talked about just a few moments back. 
And just grab that Connect card, put it in your lap. And there's a place on the back of that Connect card that if you want to make a decision for Jesus today, you can write that decision down on that card. And then this week, we're going to send you some information in the mail just on how to take those next steps, how to live your life for God. Go ahead and mark it on that card if that's what you want to do today. And then if you're here and maybe you're struggling with something and there's something specific you want us to help pray about this week, you can write that on the Connect card. And we'll pray over that this week. It's confidential. Nobody's going to know. Nobody else will see it. But we'll pray over whatever circumstance, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're going through, we'll pray with you. And just like David, just like Bathsheba, God can redeem whatever circumstance, whatever situation is happening in your life. Jesus, right now, Father, we just ask, God, for every person in this room, God, that you just touch our hearts today. God, you know where we are. God, if there be anyone in the room today that would just say, you know what, Jesus, today I want to give my life completely and totally to you. Jesus, I want to surrender myself to you today. God, we just ask right now that you just forgive us of our sins. We've done life on our own. We've messed it up. We can't do it. Father, forgive us. Today, we commit our life to you. We give you 100%. From this moment on, Jesus, my life is committed to you. And Father, for every person in this room that may be battling with shame or guilt, God, just thinking that they can't overcome it, they'll never be any better. God, they've done too much, said too much, the decisions have been too bad. God, we just ask right now, God, that you just begin to speak to our hearts and encourage us. God, that you would redeem every broken place in our lives. Just like the four women we've discussed all month long. God, you gave us those stories as examples of the goodness and the possibilities for our life. Father, just mend what's broken. And we'll give you the credit, Jesus, because you're the one who does all the work, who performs all the miracles. Thank you for speaking to us today. Jesus, we'll celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Cultivate Church, come on, can we put our hands together? Just thank God for His goodness today.